Hello and welcome to Midday Live with me, AC Benewa Oto. Let's go through our top stories coming up all in the next one hour. And former Chief of Staff and International Transition expert Nanatu Dadzi questions work of state institutions taxed with dealing with corruption. We'll bring you more on that up next. Also, Trade Union uh, Congress proposes government suspends implementation of second tier pension. We will tell you why. And in international news, Indian Prime Minister tells a space scientist he was proud of a program that had come so near to putting a probe on the moon. So these and more coming up, including sports and entertainment. Do stay with us. Let's move straight to our very first story now. The Trades Union Congress is proposing to government to suspend the implementation of a second tier pension to allow the retirees from next year recoup adequate investments. The TUC says government has delayed in releasing the funds to the trustees and fund managers for proper investment to be done, which will affect the lump sum of the pensioners. But the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, NPRA, says its suspension cannot be done. Government in 2018 released some 3.1 billion CDs to the various register schemes under the second tier. These schemes are expected to invest the amount which will raise the needed lump sum for retirees from next year. After the 3.1 billion CDs, some 22 billion CDs have been accrued as of December 2018, the temporary pension fund account, which is yet to be transferred. This delay has put fear in the trade union congress and its affiliated union that pensioners may be shortchanged. From next year, more than 1,000 contributors will retire and are expected to receive lump sum from tier 2. But the TUC is asking government to immediately suspend the implementation. If it is necessary for us even to push the date forward for our investment to yield better dividends, I think we must all come together and think about it. Because the time is too short for any of us here to expect any better thing after 20, in 2020. And no one single person can do that unless all the unions, like us meeting here, give the mandate to our leadership to ensure that we discuss this in context with the government. However, the National Pensions Regulatory Authority, NPRA, says it cannot be suspended. Tier 2 has no problem at all. Uh, and as I said, we are all expectant as to what will happen from 2020. But even then, it is not going to be some kind of a catastrophic kind of change. No. People will retire gradually. It's not like suddenly all people on tier 2 are now going to retire and so all the money you know, just get consumed. No, that's not what the situation is going to be. Already, the Health Service Workers Union is also arguing that the net lump sum from next year will be encouraging than that of the second tier. Organized labor wanted an increase of 41.9% on the state lump sum to completely erase the annuity factor deductions. But after negotiations, the party settled on a 31% from 1st June to 31st December 2019. This is the greatest achievement of the union for the year. But the NPR disagrees and it has even threatened to prosecute offenders who flout rules on a second tier payment. It is, it is, it's a matter of weeks away for us to begin to prosecute employers who are defaulting in payment to the Tier 2 scheme. Already, SNIT has been prosecuting people who default in the payment to the Tier, tier 1 scheme. So we are going to enforce, part of the private sector, sector scheme, and we are going to enforce that with, with the payments into the Tier 2 schemes as well. Meanwhile, the TUC is expecting SNIT to convene a meeting and discuss grievances with the contributions. Away from that, the Millennium Development Authority says it has not identified any information to suggest that either PDS, Carl Bank, Danwell and or personnel from MEDA committed or conspired to commit fraud or other malfeasance into the demand guarantee on the suspended PDS due. MEDA has also denied earlier reports indicating that it disagreed with the findings of FTI consulting this more in the following report. 
The investigation conducted by FTI Consulting on behalf of the Millennium Development Authority indicated, amongst other things, that the payment securities that were presented by Calbank and PDS to MIDA on February 27, 2019, which were subsequently accepted by the Ministry of Finance and ECG, are complaint with recommendations contained in the initial contract. Also, FTI concluded that they have not seen any documents that would suggest that as of March 1, 2019, PDS, Calbank, Dunwell and personnel from MIDA should have questioned the validity of the payment securities. Given that ECG is the beneficiary of the payment security, they sought guidance from the Government of Ghana Financial Advisors on what the best protocol would be to confirm the authenticity of the demand guarantees. The report suggested that PDS could not secure the demand guarantees or letters of credit as per the requirements of the LAA and the BSA from a bank because of three main challenges, being PURC's delay in approving the rate setting guidelines and the initial rate that PDS was authorized to charge. The delay in agreeing on the list of PPAs made and PDS not having a certain level of capital required for the issuance of a cashback payment security. In a related development, energy expert Kojun Safwa Poku says PDS did not have the financial muscle to have been given the concession to manage ECG assets. He spoke on the key points on the back of the FTI report which cleared PDS of wrongdoing. The entire report brings more questions than answers. If you want us to increase tariffs to the level where you can do easy recoverables, then we would have left the concession with ECG. Because the biggest problem ECG had ever complained for was not lack of manpower, lack of realistic tariffs. tariffs They've yeah. always said that they are not allowed to charge realistic tariffs. Mm. And government have said that, look, because of your old machinery, you are not able to reduce your losses from the 21% it is to acceptable levels of 8%. If we bring a company who is bringing enough money, if the company is bringing 500 million to invest in your machinery, he can reduce that losses from 21% to 8% so that you get more money. So we don't need to burden Ghanaians with more tariffs. So that issue, because look, the tariffs PDS is asking for, TPLC can never. Me and you will be overburdened. So let's not... Do you have an idea of, 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 the, of the tariff that... Tariff well, that PDS well has let me for? give you an example. Mm -hmm. In the tariff that we are paying now, mm -hmm. the lease payment, which is $100 million a quarter, PLC only factors in $56 million a quarter. So there is a differential of $46 million that is not factored into the uh, agreement, in, into the PLC calculation. So if you want PLC to now factor in the full $100 million a quarter, which is $400 million a year, Ghanaians will be overburdened. So it, was, it wasn't a straight jacket problem. And you guess what? During the conferences and the bidding process, PDA, PDS and its miracle concession was aware of these things. Be it that they were given assurances that it will be reviewed or not reviewed, they were aware that there were challenges. So let's not sidetrack. Let's go forward. So now, when the issue came up that they are not able to raise the money, the reason that nobody would give PDS the money or the guarantee is in two folds. One, the shareholders of PDS does not have any balance sheet. They don't have any balance sheet. If you go to get a guarantee from a bank, you need to present you as a company. You need to present your balance sheet. And they then the have. bank can, then the bank will do a due diligence on the on the shareholders of PDS. Then if the shareholding of PDS, the, their balance sheet is healthy, the bank can now give you the guarantee based on your, the shareholder's balance sheet. In default of the shareholders not having a balance sheet, then the due diligence is done on the asset you are going to acquire, their balance sheet. So this is purely the due diligence being done on the balance sheet of ECG. So everybody looking at ECG will tell you ECG is not profitable. We know that. True. But the issue is that we needed a competent company who has money to come in and turn ECG around. Which PDS shareholders did not have. They don't have the financial balance sheet to be able to do this transaction. They have not been able. Look, they brought two letters in the bidding process. 
two letters they brought, one from Standard Bank of South Africa and one from AFDB Bank. AFDB Bank and those letters are conditional. After they've been given a concession, and Standard Bank and AFDB Bank came and looked at the transaction, they said, look, based on the situation on the ground, we cannot support you. Because the due diligence, again, as I'm explaining, the due diligence is heavy on the balance sheet of ECG. Okay? So then, going forward from that, you realize that the government agreed that, okay, fine, no problem. If you cannot get a bank to issue you the guarantee, use an insurance company. And that we've seen in the report that the president, the vice president, the chief of staff, everybody sat and agreed. But there's a thought that IFC advised them to do that. IFC did not advise them to do it. In fact, if you look at this report, IFC was skeptical. IFC said that, look, we are not confident that the insurance companies have analyzed PDS credit and understand the risks they are assuming. A demand guarantee from an unrated insurer introduces additional complexity, resulting in significant effort on due diligence and structuring. Mm -hmm. So IFC cautioned them. Well, let's still stay on this matter. Energy expert Kwame Jantwa says discussions on the ECG concession agreement should have been immediately terminated once PDS was unable to provide the bank guarantee. He also spoke on the key points. I believe that at the point when PDS approached MIDA and said to MIDA, we are having challenges acquiring a first-class bank. So let's move and let's see whether we can use an insurance company. That was the point where everything should have stopped. That was the point where MIDA the government should have said, this particular company does not have the clout to pursue. To, to pursue. Now, Corsica said something about this initially. The collusion of uh, stakeholders. stakeholders of the ECG. ECG concession. Yes, yes, concession. They analyzed all the companies that had put their name forward to bid for this. Mm -hmm. That had Dr. Steve Mantia and the others. Dr. Steve Mantia, myself, uh, Kojo, uh, Richard Nyama, Richard Nyama mm -hmm. uh, Kofi Bentil. Bento. You know, we actually, and Koseka had started working on this thing far back, especially when the unions were having challenges with government. On the 20% local content, yes. where we went to the president and said, it needs to be increased and increased to 51. So Conseca was a stakeholder in terms of making sure that the right things are done. Now, the moment PDS came and said we can't do it, it should have stopped. Government should have gone back to MCC and said to MCC, unfortunately, the company who have won this bid do not have the financial capacity to go ahead with it. So. Let's renegotiate this MCC 500 million. The challenge we had at the time was that government was eager to access the 500 million because the due date for the expiration of that 500 million was very close. Mm. As a result of this court As action. The court and the delays, delays. and all, exactly. was very close. So we threw caution to the wind and looked more at the 500 million than looking at the company that had put its name forward to run this thing. To other issues now, and Senior Minister Yao Osafamafu says Ghana Beyond Aid Agenda has to fight against corruption as one of its key pillars. The Netherlands ambassador to Ghana had earlier challenged government to invest more into fighting corruption rather than its target of Ghana Beyond Aid Agenda. Ghana Beyond Aid is emphasizing the need to fight corruption. And I think this is all through the, it's emphasizing attitudinal change, it's emphasizing mindset, it's emphasizing core values. Talk about core values, it means that if you are to work for eight hours, you yourself, you must know that you must work for eight hours and be paid for eight hours. You don't go and play last, last year and work for one hour and be paid eight hours. That is corruption. Corruption is not only taking money from the government. Or the, corruption is anything you put in place where you shortchange the system, you shortchange the government. 
you are working for eight hours and you are paid eight hours and you work for one hour and you are paid eight hours that is corruption so we should look at all this from different angles so that Ghana beyond age becomes a framework in a related development, former chief of staff under ex-president Rawlings, Nana Atudatsi, has lamented the rising levels of corruption in the country. It's depressing. Nana Atudatsi said waking up each day to a new corruption scandal is troubling and warned the increasing corruption could sink the country. He was reacting to comments by the Dutch ambassador to Ghana, urging government to pursue a Ghana beyond corruption agenda instead of much touted Ghana beyond aid. He spoke on the key points. I, I, for the point you made, that it's not only when you collect money that constitutes uh, corruption. But also when you abuse the rules and regulations to, to influence, you know, some friends, family members, whatnot. Those are chronism. Those are, these, these are terrible things. Listen, we've had some horrible exposés of late. Oh, let's say one day, one scandal, whatever it is. We put it in almost in political terms. But let's put it aside. What worries me is that where are the institutions which has been set up by state by constitution to deal with these problems it's like we have a ton of milk you know full and then you hit the, the bottom and then it's draining and then you are looking for you know the the, the milk inside there and, you know the bulk of it is just going away by plugging it we will have enough you know to to serve everybody else you got me pds what no what no where did we hear it from where do we hear these things from not from our regular institutions or state we got them all from the social media. That is my worry. Honestly speaking, <laughs> the NDC, MPP, whatnot, everybody is worried. Mm. And that's why the, the minister, uh, senior minister has come out. We are all worried about this perception of corruption and whatnot. What's the truth in it? We must bring it down. While still staying on corruption issues, international relations expert and dean of the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College, Professor Vladimir Enchidanso, is blaming political interference in the work of state agencies for causes of corruption. He spoke on the key points earlier today. Yeah, all of us have been talking about corruption, corruption. We don't see the institutions working. Who do we blame? We're now saying the president must act. He can't act. He cannot. Why? He, no, because he doesn't have the right to act. The way we want him to, I see the president should be the, the head of every institution to tackle corruption. No, the institutions of state are built to, he can give the direction. Because if he does that, then the democracy dies. He can give the direction. My beef is with the politicians. The institutions we are talking about who should make sure that X is done properly, PDS or PBS or whatever it is, PDS. KKK or whatever it is, the police, the military, who do we put where and why? What is the remit of that institution? I've always said that the police must work according, only according to the remit of the constitution given them. Every institution must work. NCC, they must work only according to what that, that institution is built to. But the politicians tell them what to, what to do. What happens is that they are always at the back and call of the politicians not and you are afraid no 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 not ncc i, I believe <laughs> but the point is it that but, madam you are very careful not to step on the toes of those powerful politicians you are very careful you you walk a thin line my beef is with the politicians maybe i have an acerbic tongue so become a minister of something maybe i can insult the opposition better so get a get a, a and, and, and as a matter of fact, that's why mm -hmm. you will probably will be directing it back to the president because in the, the end, you said the back. Meanwhile, Chairperson of the National Commission for Civic Education, just failing Chroma, says the thinking of winning the next election is a leading cause of corruption in Ghana. I think we are going anywhere beyond aid if we do not tackle the issues of corruption. Because corruption continues to um, retard our economy. It continues to leave us worse off as citizens. And ultimately, we will continue to go begging for aid.
So we can't have a Ghana beyond aid if we don't tackle corruption. If we would talk about Ghana beyond aid, we must talk about corruption. We must talk about the values of honesty, the values of hard work, the values of integrity, the values of service and loyalty to nation. If we don't talk about these things, then the talk about corruption will be, you know, barely, you know, touching the peripherals without going to deal with root causes. We are losing our values as a country. Political patronage. So when you look about when you look at the big scandals that are going on, you find out that at behind the scenes you have persons and personalities mm -hmm. who have funded campaigns, parties, their, their governments have come into power, or their parties have come into power, and they must be recompensed for what Thank they've you. spent. So the whole issue even of our democracy, built around elections, mm -hmm. everything begins and starts and ends with elections. Sure. Elections, you win elections, and you're immediately thinking, what do I do to stay in power, and what do I do to win the, the, the power you. again? So everything is geared at that. So anyone who is working in a particular position that has been appointed by some government is thinking, I have to contribute my quota to the party. So they'll bend over backwards, they'll break the law, mm -hmm. they'll indulge in corrupt practices okay. in order to fund parties. Mm. So the whole issue about political party funding even must it's, be it's, here. It's big... And then the issue... Let's move on to other issues and the cluster on decentralization and citizenship participation has organized a walk in Tamale to sensitize the public about the affirmative action bill. The walk was to further challenge President Akufadu to use his position as the African Union gender champion and co-chair of the Sustainable Development Goals to double his efforts towards achieving the set targets in seeing to the passage of the affirmative action bill. He walked the walk is the second in a series of events targeted at expediting the passage of the bill, which seeks to at least get 40% female representation in Parliament. Some NGOs, students, women organizations, and the general public joined in the walk. In June this year, Guinea-Bissau passed the agenda equality law and subsequently appointed 50% women and 50% men to cabinet position. Well, that's good news, and we hope uh, that we also follow suit. Um, I have uh, Noam Falong, my colleague, uh, who is taking part of the walk, joining us live. Hello, good afternoon, Noam Falong. What can you tell us about the walk? Good afternoon. We're, we're still at the Tamale Sports Stadium, uh, where the walk has just ended. Uh, we had uh, a very impressive turnout okay. from most people here in Tamale. Um, interestingly, we had a lot of men joining the walk as well, I believe, because of the sensitization that has gone on before the walk. A lot more men have come to understand that affirmative action does not just target women, but benefits the entire society. So we had a good, very good numbers. There were over 800 people here today, uh, we, and then we went on the walk. Well, Falong, uh, you said you have seen quite a number of men uh, joining in. Have you spoken with any of them, and what really is your understanding, and even why are they participating in the walk? Well, most of them uh, understand that affirmative action is uh, targeted at development. And a lot of them know that without pulling women along, inclusive development cannot happen. You cannot have any nation developing without um, including especially minority groups, women, the disabled, um, all, all these uh, marginalized groups of people within the population. So they came out to lend their support to that. All right. So uh, my, we learned that minority leader Haruna Idrisu was there to lend his support. How soon uh, did he say that Parliament will work on this particular bill? Well, uh, minority leader indeed was here this morning. Uh, he came to play football. He, find, uh, he found us here, so he spoke with us. He lent his support to the whole walk. He, he did tell us he, he actually conceived that successive parliaments after the 1992 con uh, constitution have failed women in Ghana, and he's pledging his full support towards the realization of the Affirmative Action Bill. He also pledged the support of both sides of parliament. He said um, both the majority and the minority are committed to ensuring that this bill becomes a reality. Um, he didn't give us a specific okay. date, but he did offer his support completely.
Thanks so much, uh, Falong, for that update. Uh, we'll come to you subsequently, uh, probably in the evening, for more on that. You're still watching Midday Line with me, AC Binewa Oto. We take a break here. See with us more news coming up. Let's do business now. And the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana has lauded the Bank of Ghana for folding up 23 finance houses in the country. The ICAG says the decision by the BOG will build confidence in the banking sector and make the sector more resilient. The Chief Executive Officer of ICAG, Kwesi Ajimai, was interacting with a new team in Accra. He was elated that the BOG took firm decisions to collapse some finance houses with fake certification. He again said the cleanup will improve banking confidence and build a more robust economy. Rather, it should strengthen the confidence in the banking sector. Now, Bank of Ghana tells us they finished with the banking sector. What does it mean? It means that you should have assurance in the firms that are still staying. And so today, if I walk into the offices of any of these banks and savings and loan companies, I'm very comfortable that these are institutions that have stood test of time. And I feel very comfortable dealing with them. In a related development, the institute has interacted with senior high students to introduce them to chartered accountancy. The interaction focused on the need for the students to be abreast of public financial management systems before joining the accountancy profession. Discussions again centered on ethics and standards for accountancy profession. The CEO, Kwesi Ajimai, said their engagement with the students will yield the needed results. We needed to help them to actualize their dreams. We needed help to help them, help them open up an avenue where they can really learn that, oh, indeed, this is what is involved in becoming an accountant. And then the routes that they have to go through to become an accountant. Some of the students shared their experiences. I had no idea about it because, so because of that, I had a different path. But when I was given that idea, I was briefed about it. I saw that when I should choose that path, it would be far better. And even with my career, even with a little experience about that, it will help me in my career. So I thought it would be a nice idea if I should, I should choose that path. Yes, because to be an accountant, you, you, do, you do not have to just be an accountant. You must be a chartered accountant. Okay. It's like being a doctor. So we have doctors, but we have doctors that are specialized. That's the surgeon. So being a chartered accountant, it's, it means that I'm specialized in it. So it's very good with the interaction with the ICAG. In a related development, some chief executives of some commercial banks have lauded the central bank's efforts at sanitizing the banking industry. They believe the new uh, reform measures currently being implemented by the regulator has strengthened the industry. In the 2019 Ghana Banking Survey released by PricewaterhouseCoopers. The survey focused on key reforms impacting the banking sector from an inside-out perspective. Respondents included CEOs, chief finance officers, chief risk officers, chief operation officers and heads of strategy. The carefully crafted questionnaires and interviews were to elicit views on the impact of the central bank's reforms on their business. On the issue of capital requirements directive, they noted it has created some sanity in the industry following the introduction of a level playing field for all banks to comply with international standards. 42% of them were of the view that in the long run, the capital requirements directive requirements will stimulate more stringent assessment of the bank's loan profiles as a result lead to reduce non non-performing loans. In summary, I think what we're seeing is that the bank executives themselves are very, very supportive of the reforms. They believe that the reforms have strengthened the banking sector and will continue uh, to strengthen the banking sector. Uh, the three key areas are the capital directives, uh, the capitalization effort that took place or ended at, or in 31st, or on 31st December 2018, and the whole area of digita digitization and technology that's going to drive the banking business. 
On the Minimum Capital Directive, 9 out of every 10 bank executives interviewed said the directive has the potential to increase the bank's revenue. 67% however cited high credit risk as their major challenge regarding how to deploy the minimum capital. On Corporate Governance Directive, 92% of banks indicated that although they have ensured fixed-term contracts for all key appointments, they believe it is costly and undesirable to change certain key positions frequently. There has to be strong uh, focus and strong uh, management of related party transactions. Let's be clear, related party transaction in itself is not wrong, um, but it must be at arm's length. That's the key thing, it must be at arm's length. So you should not start lending to your own group companies at preferential rates and, you know, as you said, entangling things uh, from one entity to another. There may be a good reason for you to do business with a sister company, but if so, it should be at arm's length so that everybody is protected. The principle of um, uh, tenure limits is also good because it allows for a different perspective. It allows for unhealthy practices to be arrested if they exist uh, much earlier than uh, perhaps we have seen in, in some of those instances. The decision to revoke the line centers of nine banks in an effort to clean up the banking sector, although unpopular, has been welcomed by some key stakeholders in the sector who say it is a necessary measure to engender public confidence and increase investments in the medium to long term. Still in business, Director of Communications at the Ghana National Gas Company Limited, Ernesto Wusubimpa, has hinted that car partnership will receive its first natural gas in October. The company has announced that its 470 megawatts uh, Karadens Park ship uh, Osman Khan has resumed power production but will be operating on heavy fuel oil. The 470 megawatts Karadenis power ship Osman Khan has successfully been relocated to the second day naval base. According to operators of the emergency power ship, it resumed operations after a successful commissioning. The power ship will be running on heavy fuel oil to supply reliable and sustainable electricity to the national grid until ongoing works on gas pipelines are completed and fully commissioned. Officials from the Ghana National Gas Company have been inspecting work on the gas pipelines. The tie-in of a three-kilometer offshore gas pipeline from the Ingresia community to the Secondary Naval Base has been completed. Pipelines connecting to the car power ship are yet to be completed. Communications Director of the Ghana National Gas Company Limited, Ernesto Wusubempa, said, barring any unforeseen technical challenges, his outfit will start gas supply to the power ship in October. It is almost completed and the only thing is to tie in the engineering work and then the, the meter gauge there to make sure that they regulate the gas into the car power ship and that's very important. Ernesto Wusubempa indicated, Ghana Gas, together with the Ministry of Energy, are working closely with relevant stakeholders to ensure they are able to meet the October timeline. He stressed on how important it is for the power ship to run on natural gas. It's going to generate about 470 megawatts of electricity. It is costing the taxpayer almost about $20 million a month. And then the president is, you know, in his own wisdom, feel that we need to push more gas into this so that we can generate electricity for the people of Ghana. And that's all in business. Stay with us. We have more news coming up. Thanks for staying with us. The Forestry Commission is planting 32 hectares of rosewood trees uh, in eight forest districts across the country. Rosewood seedlings for the trial plantation were procured from private uh, nurseries in Tamale with proceeds from fines imposed on seized rosewood containers for the eight forest districts. A report by Peter Kwao Adato. The rosewood tree consists of a type of tropical hardwood that has become a very expensive commodity. Rosewood trees are hedges and plants which grow in shelter belts and provide important overwinter refuge, nesting sites as well as pulling and nectar feeding sources for pollinators throughout the year. Some trees take between 20 and 30 years to reach full size for slow growers and 10 to 15 years for fast growers, far better than most timber species. However, until recently the country did not see the need 
to go into its plantation. It is not a plantation. They always assume that when you get to the upper east, upper west, and north, you find a plantation all called rosewood lying there, and you know, for which people go and then and they harvest. It is not like that. But the recent invasion of the exotic timber species by both local and foreign nationals leading to its being labelled endangered tree species have shown the way. These species were not listed among the group of threatened species in the country because of restricted logging in the endemic ecological zones and the fact that traditionally it was mainly used for charcoal by the local people for income generation. The Forestry Commission has begun trial plantation across eight forest districts in the country. So far, 16 hectares have been earmarked in the northern and 8 hectares each in the Bonohafu and Ashanti regions, bringing the total to 32 hectares. However, total area developed exceeded the target of 1.8 hectares and the established stands are in good condition with varied survival and growth rates. And indeed, in Tamale, Bupe, Bole and Yendi, we had a target of 16 hectares. Out of that, we have developed 12.8 hectares. For in Kintampo and Sunyane, we had a target of 8 hectares. We have achieved 100% of that. In the Ashanti region, at Ofenso and in Kariye, we also expected to have 8 hectares as a target. We have exceeded that by planting 13 hectares and they are all doing very well. So we are not only cutting but we are also doing trial plantations with the view of establishing rosewood plantations all over uh, uh, the country. Kojo Ousue Friye urged the public to support the commission to meet its target and spread across the country. Up next is sports and Yao Ofosu Labi joins me uh, in the studio. Good afternoon, Yao. Uh, yes, what's up? So, Black Matters, what's up with them? Well, I mean, uh, the news on the Black Matters is that yesterday, their game against Algeria, they drew 1-1 and they have a second leg to play in Algiers. But is that really good news for us? It's not good news at the moment. Sure. Yeah, but we are just hoping that they can go there and pick up a win and qualify to the next stage. We trust our boys, you know. Well, <laughs> there, Let's but get the details. The sports news is right after this. Well, to our first story now, on Ghana's Olympic men's uh, football team, the Black Meteors, on Friday drew 1-1 with Algeria in the CAF under 23 Cup of Nations qualifier. Played at the Accra Sports Stadium, it was the Algerians who went ahead in the first half through uh, Zorgani Adams' goal uh, before Dauda Mohamed uh, scored through the spot kick in uh, the 65th minute of the game. Ghana had to uh, power themselves to an equaliser, but missed a penalty uh, that was poorly converted by Captain Yaya Boa in the 34th minute of the game. The second leg will be played in Algiers on Tuesday, and the winner of the tie will qualify for the AFCON and the 23 tournament in Egypt. Well, now let's just go and listen to coach uh, Ibrahim Tanko after the game. Very difficult game, but uh, in, the, in the first half, I think we, we couldn't play well, and then we got a, a chance to score a penalty, but uh, it, could, it couldn't go well for us. But I think in the second half, we came into the game very strongly. Uh, all the same, the game is not over, uh, it's 1 1, so we are going there uh, to do our best, I mean, to, to see. Uh, that we, 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 can, we can qualify. Our quali qualifying is a, is a target for us. So, uh, we are going there to, to do our best to qualify. Well, that was actually the assistant coach of the Black Meteors there, Michael Osei. Now the starting gun has been fired and the race to fill the most powerful positions in Ghana football is underway. Now the adoption of new statues by the Ghana Football Association uh, on Thursday effectively signals the commencement of the, an electoral process that will culminate in an election of the new Ghana Football Association president. We start through the Congress and here's the report. The moment the statutes were adopted, those long thoughts of having presidential ambitions declared them. Fred Papo served on the GFA Executive Committee and later became Vice President under Kwesi Nyantichi at the height of Ghana's superb World Cup runs in 2006 and in 2010. He says he is the man to restore the brand. I'm coming in with quite a lot of uh, transparency and a sense of fairness and equity. I'm coming in with a lot of commitment and passion. And more, 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 more importantly, the experience 
to deliver and the humility. I believe I, I possess those ones. I'm ready to do it. I'm ready to lead in a very inclusive way. Another former GFA vice president and executive committee member, Andanyantichi George Freye, says experience would be vital during the elections. What we need to understand is that if you look at the owners of clubs and the club CEOs and administrators who have gathered here, one thing reigns supreme, that one, they need a unifier. One, they need somebody who understands the football. This is not time for Matra Makwe. This is a time for somebody who is tried and tested. Kato Kriku declared earlier this week that he is aiming for the top job too, but Nanaya Amposa, a FIFA agent and owner of Far Rangers, has long made his intentions clear. My message is built on three pillars. First and foremost, uh, I think that the integrity of the game needs to be restored and therefore we need somebody who has integrity to have the willingness to do that. I also believe that we need to develop grassroots football, which will form the foundation of football on which the superstructure of Black Stars and the league will be built. I, I also believe that we need a commercially viable league. We need somebody who understands the commercialization of football and has pragmatic solutions to as to how we can commercialize our football. There almost certainly would be more candidates in the race, including Wilfred Osekwe Kupama. It would leave the 120 representatives who would vote for a new Ghana Football Association president with some tough choices. But the fact that it would signal the end of FIFA's normalization period of Ghana football would please many. That's all your sports news this afternoon here on Midday Life. My name is Yao Ofosulabin. And that's all the news for this afternoon. Thanks so much for watching. My name is AC Binewa Oto. Do enjoy the rest of our programs. Have a good afternoon.